So thank you again. So I'm going to be spending the next 20 minutes talking about the management of low-risk GTN. The outline of my talk will follow this slide, so indications for treatment, how we stage and risk assess these patients. Is there a best treatment for low-risk first-line treatment? What about second-line treatment? How should we optimally treat those patients? Uh, Single-agent chemotherapy or combination chemotherapy? Talk about HCG threshold for determining the switch uh, to either single agent or combination chemotherapy uh, follow up. Um, so, the most common presenting pathway for a mole is shown in the top left hand box there. And all patients in the UK are registered at one of three national screening centres for monitoring. Uh, the onset of uh, post-molar gestational trophoblastic neoplasia occurs in about 15% of complete moles and less than 1% of partial moles. And the commonest um, indication for treatment is a plateau or a rising HCG level, which can be seen in the top of the right-hand box there. The other indications for chemotherapy um, in, in the UK are seen in that right-hand box, and they broadly agree with FIGO and ESMO criteria as well. So these include heavy vaginal bleeding or evidence of gastrointestinal or in, intraperitoneal hemorrhage, evidence of choriocarcinoma, evidence of, the met, of metastases in brain, liver, gastrointestinal tract, or large uh, metastases in, in the lung. And of course, there is also the indication of a serum HCG of over 20,000 about four weeks after the, after the initial evacuation. And this is because there is a recognized risk of uterine perforation. The previous recommendation for a raised HCG six months after evacuation, even if still falling. So we used to treat these patients, uh, but now this has been removed. Um, as data from the Charing Cross showed that if these patients were monitored, HCG can spontaneously normalize, and all 65 patients left on surveillance after six months spontaneously normalized and did not need chemotherapy. There's probably also a cohort of patients with uh, low-risk uh, choriocarcinoma in whom the disease has apparently been excised and staging is negative in which it's also probably safe not to rush into chemotherapy as long as these patients are compliant with HCG follow-up and the HCG continues to fall. In our own series, there was 10% um, of patients with low-risk choriocarcinoma who normalized their HCG without the need for chemotherapy. Uh, and the French um, series uh, has a, a larger series of 36 patients also showing the same. So histological evidence of choriocarcinoma is not necessarily a definitive indication for treatment. Because most patients developing postmolar GTN can be detected early by HCG monitoring, extensive staging is not normally required. So when patients come for staging, they obviously have blood tests, including serum HCG. They have an ultrasound pelvis to exclude pregnancy, to um, assess extent of disease within the abdomen and pelvis look for uterine enlargement and volume, and also an assessment of vascularity. And there is some data to suggest that uterine artery pulsatility index can be an independent prognostic factor for developing resistance to first-line methotrexate. Patients also have a chest x-ray, and if that is normal, there is no need to do a, a CT of the chest as the detection of micrometastatic disease, which is probably in about 40% of patients, does not uh, affect patient outcome. If this chest x-ray is abnormal, patients should have a CT plus uh, an MRI brain if the lung metastases are numerous and large. So FIGO report uh, outcome on GTD using this prognostic um, scoring system uh, that uh, was shown by Eleanor. And all clinicians since 2002 should be using this um, prognostic scoring system to allow comparison of data between centers. This scoring system predicts the potential for the development of resistance to first-line chemotherapy with either methotrexate or dactylobicin. So patients score between zero and four points for each of the prognostic factors of age, antecedent pregnancy, 
the interval in months from the index pregnancy to chemotherapy, the pretreatment HCG, tumor size, site and number of metastases, and if they've had any previous failed chemotherapy. So patients who score zero to six are deemed low risk, and that's probably 85 to 90% of patients. And they can be treated or started treatment with single agent chemotherapy, and methotrexate is the treatment of choice in the United Kingdom. Patients scoring a seven or more are deemed high risk, and they have virtually no or very little um, chance of cure with single agent chemotherapy, so should be given combination chemotherapy from the outset. And Leon's very eloquently talked about the role of second evacuation and hysterectomy, so I won't mention that. So, in terms of first line treatment in low risk disease, is there a best treatment? So, single agent chemotherapy uh, with methotrexate or dactinomycin are the preferred options. And as I said, in the UK, we use um, methotrexate. There are a variety of regimens that have been published, and data from many non-randomized retrospective studies show complete remission rates of about 50 to 90 percent, with the variability being explained by differences in dose, schedule, method of administration, and the patients included in those studies. The updated Cochrane meta-analysis was published in 2016, and this had seven randomized controlled trials of 667 women. And that concluded with moderate certainty evidence that dactinomycin was more likely to lead to primary cure than methotrexate, but also that dactinomycin was associated with a greater risk of toxicity, although that was with lower certainty evidence. Limitations of this meta-analysis was that the, many of the trials included were underpowered and there was a comparison of regimens uh, that are not used internationally. So we use methotrexate as our standard first-line low-risk treatment. We use an intramuscular regimen of 50 milligrams on alternate days for four injections. Uh, on the alternate days, you have um, folinic acid, which is 24 to 30 hours after the methotrexate injection. This is repeated two weekly until HCG is normal. And then for six weeks, so patients have three consolidation cycles after their first, after their first normal level. And this is important. So there's non-randomized data from the Dutch and Charing Cross group, which show that even giving perhaps one less consolidation cycle may lead to an increased risk of relapse. Um, so patients receiving two cycles of consolidation had an 8% risk of relapse versus 4% in those patients having um, three consolidation cycles. So it's non-randomized data, but certainly food for thought. So we standardly give six weeks of consolidation. Methotrexate's uh, pretty well tolerated. Depending on the series you look at, the toxicity uh, is between 2 and 6%. And commonly, it's dry, um, dry and sore eyes mouth ulcers, and people, uh, patients can get pleuritic and peritoneal pain from a chemical serositis. And in a small number of patients, that leads to a change of chemotherapy because of toxicity. There have been attempts to do randomized trials. So this was a GOG275. This was an American trial. So this was a phase three randomized trial of dactinomycin versus multi-day methotrexate. So there was two schedules of methotrexate in this trial. There was the one that I've just shown that we use in the UK. And then there was a um, intravenous methotrexate regimen. So um, I think that was a dose of 0.4 milligrams um, per kilogram daily for five days and repeated every, uh, every, every, every two weeks. So this trial uh, ran from June 2012 to September 2016, and sadly, it closed early due to poor recruitment after 57 patients were recruited. Um, so underpowered study, but the results were, put, uh, were um, presented um, at the Amsterdam International Conference uh, a couple of years ago. And this did show that the HCG complete response rate for patients treated with dactinomycin was 75% versus 89% in those patients treated with methotrexate. This was not statistically significant, 
Um, side effects wise, mucositis, as you'd expect, was more common with methotrexate. And half the patients on the methotrexate arm found the multi-day regimen inconvenient, but the quality of life scores were overall similar. Um, and I think for me, this I was the UK uh, chief investigator for this trial, and I think for me it certainly highlighted the problems that despite international collaboration in the, cre in the creation and, and execution of this study, there are significant um, complex uh, regulatory barriers that we have to overcome before we're going to be able to, to successfully run randomized trials in rare diseases. And that's something we could probably think about. So it's well documented in the literature that there is a ongoing need for second line chemotherapy, despite our best attempts to risk score these patients. Uh, and we know that across the low risk range, about 65 to 75 percent of patients will get a complete response to first line chemotherapy. So there are a significant proportion that do develop methotrexate um, resistance, and that uh, the chances of that happening increase with higher FIGO scores, a diagnosis of choriocarcinoma, higher pretreatment HCG and the presence of metastatic disease. So from our own series in Sheffield, you can see uh, in the graph there that a patient scoring uh, a six, they only had a 19% chance of a complete response to methotrexate. And the, the um, other UK data from both our centre and from Michael at Charing Cross, if uh, patients had a very high pretreatment HCG, it's only 16% of those patients uh, who had a pretreatment HCG of over 100,000 achieved a complete response, whereas no patients, if they have very high levels of over 400,000, uh, uh, experienced a, a complete response. So these are the sorts of patients that we need to be doing something differently in. However, we, as we've heard from Leon, overall survival in low-risk disease should be 100%. So most of us take the approach that it's still very reasonable to give the least toxic treatment first. Because even with a score of six, you've got a one in five chance of having complete response. And um, nice data from Michael's group show that treating until methotrexate resistance and then changing to combination chemotherapy only actually prolongs your treatment duration by two weeks and does not compromise long-term outcome. However, I think what this data clearly shows is that we need to think about how we can refine the FIGO scoring system so that we can upfront identify the 30% um, of patients who will develop methotrexate resistance and can be uh, thought about giving them more intensified treatment upfront uh, and work on behalf of the International Society is um, going on in this area currently. So what's the best strategy after methotrexate failure? Should we be using single agent chemotherapy or should we be using combination chemotherapy? So certainly single agent daxinomycin is effective. There are several retrospective series, but no randomized controlled trials. And comparison between these series is very difficult due to different scheduling and uh, HCG thresholds. Data from the UK in terms of from our group in Sheffield and Charing Cross show that response to second line daxinomycin is between 90 to 94%. And the French series published uh, last year showed a slightly lower complete response rate of 76%, but the French didn't use a um, threshold to determine the switch between single and combination chemotherapy, because in the UK, at the development of methotrexate resistance, we do use an HCG threshold to inform that switch. So should we go to single agent chemotherapy second line, or should we go to second line combination chemotherapy? Clearly, combination chemotherapy is extremely effective, and examples of regimens include three-day etoposide and ductilomycin, or EMACO. So whilst they're clearly very effective, they are potentially toxic. There is a well-documented small increased risk of, of leukemia. There's an increased risk of early menopause. And clearly, this is more inconvenient for the patients. It's largely associated with inpatient treatment, higher treatment, delivery costs, more inconvenience to the patient, and of course, hair loss. 
So in 2011, um, it, as a strategy to try and reduce the number of patients being exposed to combination chemotherapy, we uh, evolved our treatment protocols in Sheffield in 2011. So this was uh, all our patients treated between 2001 and 2015, and you can see that 35% of them developed methotrexate resistance. So instead of switching these patients when they developed methotrexate resistance at higher levels of HCG, instead of switching them to combination chemotherapy, we switched them to single agent carboplatin. So prior to this, if your HCG was less than 300 at the time of methotrexate resistance, patients were treated with single agent dactinomycin. And above 300, they received three day dactinomycin and the top aside and the doses are shown there. Um, so it's a three day inpatient regimen every 10 days plus six weeks of remission. The following um, six weeks of, of consolidation first since first HCG, normal HCG. So our complete remission rates are, were 89%, but there was significant toxicity. So there's a 43% grade three and grade four neutropenia rate, 100% um, alopecia, significant nausea and vomiting, and mucositis. So, you know, potentially reasonably toxic regimen. So uh, we published our experience with carboplatin in 2016. So uh, in summary, this was 21 patients that we treated between 2011 and 2015. Patients were low risk, so they scored zero to six. Um, the atypical um, trophoblastic tumors were excluded, so it was only uh, complete moles, partial moles, post-molar GTN and, and choriocarcinoma. They had to have resistance to methotrexate, which was confirmed by a rising HCG or a plateau, and obviously the HCG of over 300. Um, carboplatin was used AUC6 every three weeks. We dosed it on a Cockcroft um, GALTS calculated creatinine clearance. It's a 30-minute outpatient treatment, and we retreated if the neutrophils were at one or more and a platelet count of more than 75. We dose reduced to AUC5 if there was a grade three or grade four toxicity or a treatment delay. Again, we treated to remission plus two cycles. So these are the results. So in terms of the median number of cycles, it was five uh, cycles per, per patient, and the total number of cycles we gave was 109. So 24% of these cycles uh, were delayed, and 28% of those cycles were given at a dose reduction. HCG at the time of switch was uh, just over 2,000, and our overall response rate, so our complete HCG response rate, was um, achieved in 17 patients out of 21, um, so that was 81%. Those four patients that failed were salvaged with um, third-line combination chemotherapy. Uh, updated results from last year, so we treated a further seven patients uh, with no further failures. So the updated headline is that the overall complete response rate was 86%. So very similar to the 89% that we saw with combination chemotherapy. Uh, Non-hematological toxicities were, as, as you would expect, uh, reasonably well tolerated, and as you'd expect, no alopecia. However, there was dose-limiting hematological toxicity, so there was a um, about a 38% uh, percent, um, grade 3, grade 4 neutropenia and a 28% grade 3, grade 4 thrombocytopenia. We had one episode of neutropenic sepsis, 30% of patients required GCSF support. Um, in terms of other outcomes, uh, fertility, so um, five patients had had one successful pregnancy, another patient had sadly had a miscarriage, but 60% of patients were menstruating, and obviously early days, but no secondary malignancy reported. So the carboplatin story continues with this publication from the Brazilian group that was published in Gynae Oncology this year. Um, so they, largely because of the, um, they weren't able to get hold of dactinomycin, there was a drug shortage in the country. So they treated uh, patients similar to ours on the basis of um, no dactinomycin, but also knowledge of our data. So they treated 23 patients uh, with low risk GTN following methotrexate failure. And you can see their complete response rate was significantly less at 
The patients that failed uh, were salvaged mostly with then um, third line uh, chemotherapy, which was combination chemotherapy, and three patients required fourth line treatment. If we look at, at these populations, there were some um, differences. So you could actually argue that the Sheffield cohort were perhaps slightly higher risk. So there was a higher proportion of patients scoring a, a higher within the higher end of the low risk group. Um, the HCG at diagnosis was higher in the Sheffield population, so maybe a higher, higher risk population. But the main thing really, when you look at their treatments, is that in the Brazilian population, um, only 52% of chemotherapy cycles were delivered on time compared to 76% in our data. And again, uh, only 48% uh, so, sorry, forty-eight percent of the cycles were given at a dose reduction, which was which was more than in in our data. So, I think obviously dose intensity was less in the Brazilian group, which may explain some of these results. But I think it also goes to show that you know treatment that works in one country, you can't always assume that when you transfer that to another country in a similar population, is always going always going to work. And whether that's patient factors, uh, ethnic differences. Um, tumor biology differences remains unclear. So what other strategies can we do to uh, reduce the number of women being exposed to combination chemotherapy? So um, in the UK, uh, the UK service has over the years tried to increase the cutoff level, so the HCG threshold at which we use combination chemotherapy rather than um, single agent chemotherapy. So this was data published uh, presented by Charing Cross at the international meeting in Amsterdam in 2017. And you can see that dactinomycin is certainly active at higher levels. Um, but uh, as you can see uh, on the left hand column there with the uh, rising threshold, but as you can see as the HCG threshold rises, the, uh, the um, salvage rate to dactinomycin does fall. And, um, and uh, pre-treatment uh, FIGO scoring doesn't seem to reflect a chance of um, success with dactinomycin. So, but the important thing from this is that dactinomycin salvaged 93% of patients with an HCG of less than 1,000, and crucially, uh, overall survival is still 100%. And you can see that from this series, 14 patients were spared combination chemotherapy. So that can only be a good thing. So as we try and um, increase the HCG threshold for switch, we will reach a point at which the chance of dactinomycin success is low. But what we've done in the UK recently is that we've now raised the threshold once again. So if you develop methotrexate resistance now up to 3,000, you will have single agent dactinomycin. But if your level is over 3,000 and under 30,000, we're now going to use, well, we're going to use carboplatin, but at a different schedule. So a carboplatin AUC4 every two weeks. That's to see if it's more effective, but also to see if we can reduce some of the hematological toxicity. And then we'll reserve uh, multi-agent chemotherapy for levels of over 30,000 or, or third line. In terms of follow-up from low-risk treatments, um, generally patients recover over weeks. The risk of relapse is small, um, so it's less than 5%, and three quarters of those relapses will occur over the first 12 months. So particularly over the first 12 months, we monitor the patients quite intensively, and we recommend avoiding pregnancy during this time. Patients can use any contraceptive method as long as there's no contraindication to that. So this just shows the follow-up protocol in Sheffield. So you can see it's quite intensive with weekly and monthly monitoring for the first um, year, and then ultimately dropping off to six monthly urine HCGs for life. However, um, further data from Charing Cross, and now we've updated this as a whole UK series, shows that actually there's been no relapses after seven years. So now we've made a recent change in the UK that for low risk and standard high risk patients, so not ultra high risk and not those patients that have had immunotherapy 
um, or PSTT or ETT, we're actually going to follow these patients up for 10 years only rather than lifelong. So this will have significant implications for, for patients in terms of not having to do lifelong um, samples, but also will have a beneficial effect on cost. We know that fertility is not affected with methotrexate and there is no significant increased risk of menopause. And of those women wishing to uh, have a successful pregnancy, about 83% of those will be successful. And we know that there's no increased risk of, of congenital malformations with methotrexate or a risk of secondary malignancies. And I'd like to leave it there, so thank you.